Eddie House played in the NBA for over a decade. He played for the Heat, the Celtics, the Suns. A lot of these teams you're watching right now, and he's joining us. Eddie, I haven't seen you in a long time. You got your Sun Devil stuff on. Good for you. So I want to ask you, I want to ask you about this. Jimmy Butler. So analytically, you know, everybody loves analytics. He's a mid-range guy. He's, he, that, that's what he is. He's a mid-range guy. But it is interesting how Jimmy's stats get better in the playoffs, which is weird because it's against better teams, better players, better coaches, better cultures. How do you view Jimmy Butler? I view him as a, as a superstar. I mean, he's a guy who's the face of the franchise with the Heat, and he's Miami Heat personified. If you ask about the Miami Heat culture, he's exactly what the Miami Heat culture, he represents that Miami Heat culture to a T, a guy who's hardworking, doesn't really get a whole lot of credit, just like the organization didn't get a whole lot of credit this year for being the best in the East all season long. But when it comes down to it, he makes plays. He's gritty. He's a grinder. He gets defensive stops. He Last night was something that he showed you that not only was he prepared, like that play right there, that means he's been watching film, understanding that Robert Williams catches the ball with his back turn. Jason Tatum tends to throw a lazy pass right there, that play there. And that's just film, being prepared, and that's what the Miami Heat do. And it's not glamorous, right? Well, he's not the guy that you're like, man, you look up, he had 41 points, but it wasn't loud 41 points. He just goes about his work in a workmanlike manner, and he just gets it done on both ends of the court. Um, you know, it's Boston has had, you know, it's funny, Robert Williams, I, was, I went to stats last night, and he's the classic Celtic. They draft him out of Texas A&M. He averages two and a half, then five, then eight. Then I think he averages like 11. They're very patient. They've been patient with Marcus Smart and Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. And it's not a great free agent market. A lot of NBA players don't want to go up to cold Boston in the winter. We know that. They want to go to Miami, L.A., Phoenix, wherever. Um, but I said this the other day. If, if Boston doesn't get to the finals and they need to win one, because they can make fun of the Lakers, but in 35 years, the Lakers have eight titles. In 35 years, the Celtics have one, and they've been really patient, and they develop. But Eddie, if they get knocked out by Miami in, the, in, in what's mostly been the weaker Eastern Conference for 35 years, do you just bring this team back and these guys? I kind of feel like Tatum's, this is what he is, and this is what Jalen is, this is what Marcus is. If you can't win it this year, because you got a break, because Chris Middleton was hurt, you got a huge break. What do you do with this Boston team? You can't you can't break this up. I think you're looking at Jason Tatum emerging as a superstar. He didn't have a superstar second half, but definitely was the play, best player in the first half of that game yesterday. Uh, Jalen Brown is a guy who is knocking on the door of stardom, right? He wants to. He's a star, and he's trying to become a superstar. He has levels that he has to reach, and he has some some things in his game that he has to, to tie up, but. And Marcus Smart, you know, just being a defensive player of the year, I don't think you break that core up. I think you try to add pieces around them like they have been doing with the Grant Williams, with the Peyton Pritchards. And then you bring Al Horford in, an OG vet who just knows how to play the game. You add Robert Williams in there, a guy who protects the rim. I think you, everybody forgets how young these guys are. They've been to Eastern Conference Finals before, so they've been knocking on the door. You got to just stay patient with this. You don't want to break this group up. I mean, they're the perfect group because they have – the size, they have athleticism, they have both scoring, they have a one-two punch, and then they all can switch defensively. Yesterday, I don't think we want to press the panic button because of what happened yesterday. That was a third quarter. Without yeah. that third quarter, you look at what the Celtics did. They outplayed the Miami Heat for three quarters. But unfortunately, it's a 48-minute game for the Celtics. And in that third quarter, it was just a, a, a horrible, horrible third quarter. You know, having played in the NBA, you were a, you were um, two finals appearances, three conference finals appearances. And what happens, Eddie, you know this, is that good teams get old. The Utah Jazz got old. Uh, uh, you know, the Jordan team got old, but they won a championship. We've saw the Lakers this year. You start getting old. Guys get hurt. You know, you had Melo and AD and LeBron and and and. You know, I look at the Warriors right now, and Steph can get injured, and Clay's not the same. Draymond's still great, but – and then they have the emerging Jonathan Kaminga and Jordan Poole. And I look at them, and I think, here's Dallas, younger, a lot of energy, Luka. So this series to me feels like the energy in the youth of Dallas and the experience and the wisdom of the Warriors. Who do you like and why? Well, it's, it's hard to go against that championship pedigree. And, but the way that Dallas is playing, they've been coaching great. 
Jason Kidd making great in-game adjustments, game-to-game adjustments, in-quarter adjustments, and that's what it's going to take. And Luka just being a beast. I mean, there's really no, – and it's funny because the way he plays is so at his own pace and it's not fast, it's not athletic, but he plays these angles with his body and he's able to get whatever he wants when he wants it. And to me, that's what – is so special about him that he plays at a pace, he puts people to sleep and he gets where he wants to go. But once he gets that going, if you start gearing your defense totally towards him, he's such a great passer. So it hinges on what are the Dallas others going to do? They didn't show up at the beginning of the series against the Suns, but it late in that series, they were there. Dinwiddie was there. Jalen Brunson was there. Uh, guys were knocking down shots from the outside. And once that happens, it makes them very hard to guard and they are guarding on the other end. So, I'm going to go with the, with all that being said, I'm still going to go with the experience of the Warriors. I think that where the Warriors can get beat, though, I think they could get beat beat up on the glass a little bit. But um, Dallas really don't have huge players to where you have to worry about that. I think at the end of the day, the way Steph can shoot, the way Clay can shoot, Poole's been playing well. If Draymond is taking his eyes to the rim a little bit, just a threat at scoring like he did in, in game six, I think the Warriors get it done. You know, you, uh, you've you got your Arizona State stuff on. Eddie House joining us, NBA champ with the Celtics. When you look at the Phoenix Suns, so they could let DeAndre Ayton walk, but then they wouldn't have any size. Uh, Nick Wright came on earlier and said, you know, Chris Paul's 37. Um, clearly, he looked worn out at the end of that series. Should the Suns consider saying, listen, Booker, DeAndre Ayton, and Mikhail Bridges are going to be our future. Chris Paul's been amazing, but we probably, the Booker-Chris Paul thing, we've seen it. We've got no titles. What do you do if you're Phoenix? Two years left with Chris. Do you let Aiton walk? You can't pay everybody in this league. There's a salary cap. What do you do if you're Phoenix after that horrible Game 7 performance at home? You, you know what? I think that you could blame that Game 7 on a couple things, right? I think that you look at how they played last year, a very long season, a, a finals run, right? You go to the finals, you lose in the finals, you have a short off season. Then they went for the gusto to have home court advantage throughout the playoffs, right? Guys were tired, and it was the last game that – it was the, the – the game seven is a game where you're not ever supposed to get tired, but it looked like everybody collectively was tired. And then plus the looming thing about DeAndre Ayton, not signing him – I think that affected that team a whole lot. I think that wore down on the team. And that was something that was looming over all season long. And they kind of played through it. But I just think it came to a head in game seven. And when the pressure started ratcheting up from Dallas and then they're at home and nobody's knocking down shots, I think you have to t you have to sign DeAndre Ayton is at the end of the day. You're not going to find another guy like him to replace him or another two guys that are going to replace what he can do. So I think that that was a, they kind of dropped the ball on that. They should have got that done that way. He was not worried about anything except playing basketball, and they weren't worried about anything except trying to win a championship instead of thinking like, man, I got to get numbers. I got to do this. Are they going to resign me? Am I going to go somewhere else? And then all those grumblings and just it's the wrong mindset to be having when you're trying to make a, a title run. You were a second-round pick out of Arizona State. I showed the top 12 players remaining – in the four teams. Only two, Bama to Bayou, Kentucky, Jason Tatum, Duke, were from Blue Bloods. Jalen Brunson and uh, Draymond Green are kind of from Blue Bloods, but they were second-round picks, so they came in with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. And that when you look at the, the players remaining, it's remarkable how many came from Washington State, Marquette, Cal, as I put it up here, international guys, Oklahoma State. I'm not saying they're bad programs, but it's funny because you came and had a great career from a non-traditional basketball powerhouse. And my argument is, like NFL quarterbacks, that a lot of these players, none of them were number one picks, none of them were number two picks, most did not go to Blue Bloods, is that the difference between college and pro isn't just talent, it's toughness. That you have to, you have to understand the game's more physical, uh, the coaches are coaching you harder, your takeaway when you, I mean, Jimmy Butler's a great example, goes to a non-power, Marquette, D. Wade, Marquette. When you, you were a second round pick, am I, am I, am I kind of reaching here or do you think there is something to be said about toughness, durability, coachability? It's, it's not just, Hey, this guy's really talented. 
I, it just shows that it's ballers everywhere. And you don't have to go to a blue blood to get to the league, but you do have to have some sort of toughness. And you got to have a good coaching staff that develops you. You know, you're looking at Spencer Dinwiddie, a guy that went to Colorado. Tab Boyle's a great coach. He develops his players. A lot of players go there. They're usually two, but three to four year players. He gets guys that transfer in as juniors. Derek White is another guy that went to Colorado. So, I mean, you, you look at, at these guys who get great coaching that get developed that stay for a while. They usually come in prepared, ready to play. Like you mentioned, Jalen Brunson. That's a guy who was a four-year player at a yep. school, and he got coached by Jay Wright. He's coached up. He's ready to play when he steps into the league. So I think it has a lot to do with the coaching staff and then also the players. The players, you got to have a tough mindset. And a lot of us coming in in the second round feel like, hey, man, I should have been in the first round. There's a couple cats that I know for sure I'm <laughs> way better than. But yeah. it just didn't happen that way. And you play like that throughout your whole career knowing that, you know, you have a, have something to prove all, all, all the time. Eddie, it's great seeing you again. Haven't seen you in a nice while. Nice to see you too, man. Eddie House. Uh, yeah, he was a second-round pick out of Arizona State. Arizona State, James Harden's from Arizona State. Uh, there, there's something about it. There is. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.